So good afternoon everybody. I hope we're all having a lovely day. What a lovely day it is to be inside in a cinema, right? <laughs> um, so today, as you can see by the title, I'm going to be talking about static analysis tools, um, which are very, very cool and fun. Uh, before I do that, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Jamie Lee Coleman. I'm a developer advocate for Sonatype. Um, previously, I worked at IBM, so worked on mainframes, very, very different to what I do now. Um, WebSphere, OpenJ9, and all that good stuff. So, uh, JCon has just requested, well, they requested a while ago, but they've requested that you use Slido um, to ask questions. So, if you scan that link, um, basically, you can use Slido and just write in your questions down. So, um, without further ado, so, who's heard of Sonotype? This is where I'm from. Cool, quite a few of you. Yes, I love Germany because um, actually quite a few of you know who we are. Um, with Java, you're probably familiar with Maven Central. So, this is something we do for the community. Um, we've been doing it for quite a long time now, 12 years. Uh, it runs on AWS, so you can imagine our cloud bill is not the cheapest cloud bill in the world. I think we've recently served up something like I can't remember how many trillion artifacts for everyone in the Java community, but it's just something we do at Sonotype. Um, you might be familiar with some of our commercial products, stuff like Repo, um, Firewall, things like that, and Lifecycle. Anyway, so what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about what a static analysis tool is, the difference between source code analysis and bytecode analysis, um, things that you should be considering when you're picking a static analysis tool, um, what are some random analysis terms that we should be aware of? Um, what different static analysis tools are available? And I'm going to give you a demo of one of them. Not a Sonotype static analysis tool, but one I've played around with and I think is very, very cool and very useful. Um, then we're going to talk about what composi software composition analysis is, why that's important and goes together with static analysis tools, um, talk about some of the SCA tools that are available, talk a little bit about what software bill of materials are because that's becoming very, very important, especially in the EU with the new legislation coming out. Then I'm going to talk about, show you a little demo of one of Sonatype's tools um, and then kind of a conclusion analysis at the end. So static analysis, this is part one. Um, what is static analysis? What is a static analysis tool? Well, essentially, it's a tool that will be scanning your code. Um, it's trying to find programming errors in your code. Um, it's a good tool will try and enforce good programming best practices generally, um, find syntax violations, and sometimes security vulnerabilities, right? And I'll show you a tool that does some of those later. Um, what can they do as a consequence? So that is the main points of what a static analysis tool does. But as a consequence, they can help make your applications more efficient, right? If we're writing things in inefficient ways and the static analysis tool can pick that up, it can make our code more efficient. Um, it can help improve developers' coding skills, right? We have lots of junior developers enter our organizations, and the senior developers spend a lot of time having to train them, get them up to standard, tell, teach them what best practices are. So as a consequence of using these tools, it can help make your developers' coding skills better. Um, it can make your application code easier to read. I mean, we're all probably familiar with legacy code. You start at a new company or on a new project, and someone's wrote code from 10 years ago, especially in the Java community, because Java's been around so long. I think Java's going to outlive us all, just to let you know. But um, yeah, it's one of those things. Oh, I don't know why that keeps making a noise. Um, it's one of those things that can make our code easier to read for the next generation of people that pick up Java in the next 100 years, right? <laughs> Um, it can shorten the time from development to production because we have a lot of time, we might put stuff into testing, etc., and find that um, there's common errors in there, there's syntax problems, etc. So having these kind of tools can speed up that process rather than having to go backwards and forwards constantly. And it can make your team at programming heroes, right? If we can get stuff to production a lot quicker, um, not only our team leads are going to like us and the people in our engineering organization, but those people at the top, you know, those executive people, um, it can make them happier because they're getting functionality shipped into their products a lot quicker. And these things are quite important, right? Um, very small mistakes can have big consequences. So the difference between these two lines of code is a CVE, is a vulnerability, right? And that's something we, I mean, I'm guilty of doing things like this all the time. Um, and things like that are quite hard to miss unless you know what you're looking for. 
So having static analysis tools can really, really help with not making mistakes like this and introducing vulnerabilities into your code. So the software supply chain, um, something Sonotype has kind of coined and been talking about for years. This is how we kind of see it going, you know, you've got your source control, you bring in your stuff from your public repositories, you put them in your internal repository, um, you pull that down onto your developer's laptop, you do a build, you write your codes, it goes back into your repository again, into release, etc. Um, so source code analysis kind of sits more at the developer's end of this, and bytecode analysis is more down that end, right? So basically um, having a look at what's been compiled. So what is bytecode analysis? Um, bytecode analysis essentially generates a map of the data flows through your application. Um, this map builds, this is builds a map by reading the bytecode and emulating complication in C in Java. And then this map is analyzed to find entry sources and exit sinks, right? And these are points, um, points of control of our code, right? So we want to know what's going on in there. Um, the analysis will generate findings for sources that are found where the pathways to a sync exists and the routine which clean, uh, cleanses the data is not found, okay? So there's advantages and disadvantages of using bytecode um, over doing the source code. For example, you've got higher accuracy. Um, you can have custom rules to reduce false negatives. You can define sanitizers, validators to reduce false positives. Um, you can have data traces from sync to source, but there are disadvantages as well, right? So it's very, very slow compared to source code analysis, right? Um, the code must be in bytecode format, so it has to be compiled, and this is quite resource heavy. So realistically, you want to be trying to do this kind of analysis as early on in the development cycle as possible, so on the developer's laptop. So more source code analysis is generally better, and better for the planet, right? We're using less resources. So some of the things, this is some of the main points I want you to take away when we think about um, static analysis and static analysis tools, right? Um, a tool is great, right? It can look good, it can have really good functionality, but if the data behind it is no good, if it doesn't have the right data, it's a pretty useless tool, okay? Um, and who describes what best practices are anyway? That's just someone's opinion. You might go from one company to another company or one team to another team, and you may find that best practices completely change, right? I mean, who defines what they are? That's just someone's opinion. Yes, you might have more performant practices and things like that, but generally that's you know subjective to the team and the person that's controlling the team. Um, what we don't want is false positives and negatives, right? This is annoying for us. We do not want to be chasing issues that aren't really an issue, okay? Um, so you want to try and avoid tools and things like that that essentially throw up false positives because it's wasting your time, it's wasting your development team's time, it's wasting everyone's time, okay? Um, and what we really, really want is a tool that allows us to customize things, okay? So, for example, um, going back to the best practices points, is we want to be able to have a tool that we can tell it what the best practices are for that team, okay? Because, like I mentioned, best practices change from team to team and company to company. So having a tool that allows you to have customization, to have policies on a team-by-team -team basis is really, really useful. And that can enforce your junior engineers to, okay, we don't want to pollute their minds and make sure they're programming in this narrow thing, but if you've got a load of senior engineers all come together to kind of create this customization, these policies, um, it can be really, really good to help your junior engineers catch up very, very quickly and learn more, rather than constantly having to come and keep asking your senior engineers, et cetera, um, how to do this and how to do that. So some other static analysis tool terms you should be aware of. Um, control flow analysis is very, very cool. It's something that's quite easy to, easy to do in Java. Um, lots of tools are able to do it. And essentially the purpose of this is to analyze information about which functions can be called at various points during the execution of a program. So rather, if you look at this from say a vulnerability or a security point of view, it's a way to kind of essentially see um, if we're hitting that bit of code that might not be any good, that might have a vulnerability, right? Um, one of the things, again, with Java, when to hit a vulnerability, we generally have to call that line of code. Well, that's not so much the case in other ecosystems, like when you run an NPM install, um, anything can happen. Any kind of malware or vulnerability can come to surface. Yes, there are ways to do it in Java, but generally, um, unless you're hitting that vulnerability, that method, that line of code, um, it's not a problem. So call flow analysis can have a look and basically see 
um, if what your application is actually doing and if you should be worried about some of the parts like dependencies you're using and if they're going to be an issue. Um, data flow analysis is a technique designed to gather information about the values of each point of your program and how they essentially change over time. And this technique is often used by compilers to optimize your code, right? So dynamic analysis terms. Um, I'm not going to explain what testing is. I presume we all know what testing is, hence there's five dots there. Um, program monitoring is a term where basically it records and logs different kinds of information about your program. It can be resources, it can be usage, any events, any interactions that go on, things like that. And then it can be reviewed to find uh, pinpoint cases if you've got abnormal behavior in your applications, okay? So that's one term. Um, the other one is program slicing. So program slicing is essentially a way to cut down your application to the minimum possible to achieve the function you're trying to essentially analyze, okay? So trying to remove all the bits on the edges that aren't doing anything to what you're trying to achieve and then are testing your application. So some static analysis tools that are out there. Um, so, okay, I've already gone over this. Essentially, static analysis tool, what is it? Um, it's there to enforce coding standards. Um, it's there to basically um, stop insecure coding patterns. It can also measure your test coverage, um, control flow, nesting of data flows, and even documentation and requirements that are on your docs, right? So static analysis tools, some of the more powerful ones, are really, really useful and can help us in so many different ways. Um, these are my three favorite static analysis tools, nothing to do with Sonatype. Um, Sonacube is not part of Sonatype, just so you all know. We have this problem of everyone's like, Sona who? Yeah, no, they're not us, different company. Probably shouldn't have used them as an example, but they are a very, very good tool to do that. Um, we've got SemGrep, which I'm going to show you a very, very quick demo today of how easy it is to get started with this. Um, I believe the CLI for SemGrep is open source. Um, I'm going to be using the dashboard just to make it really easy to show you um, how to analyze an application. And then, of course, we've got Open Rewrite. Open Rewrite is really there to kind of large scale things, you know, moving from Java 8 to 17, these tedious tasks that take forever. Open Rewrite has like, essentially a load of recipes that can help with that. So, Open Rewrite, if you haven't tried it out, it's a really, really good tool as well. Um, and I think the open rewrite from Modern, the guys are here. So do go and talk to them and ask them about it. So a little demo of SemGrep. Now, I already did the analysis earlier, so I'm going to do it backwards. And I'm just going to show you the output and then show you very, very quickly um, how it quickly is to scan an application. But rather than you sit here and wait for three minutes to scan my application, um, I've done that for, for first, and I'll go backwards. Um, the application I'm uh, scanning, you're welcome to check it out. Um, it's a workshop we ran at DevNexus and we ran here at JCon yesterday. It's an AI application that uses um, Lang4j, connects to Hugging Face in the back end. Um, and basically, it's a web application that allows you to talk to the language model at the back end. So this is essentially SemGrep's um, dashboard. Very, very simple. Um, I've analyzed this project earlier. I'll show you very quickly afterwards how to import that. But as you can see, it's found some things, right? It's found insecure document methods. It knows it missed the runner's non-root is more of an advisory. As we know, we should try and not um, allow our containerized applications too many permissions. But as you can see, already, I mean, this is a very small application, right? It's like six different class files. And it's already found five, fa uh, five things that could be done better. Okay, I don't know what that says about my programming, but yes, as you can see, um, it's found some things. Okay, so this tool again is really really cool because it allows us to define things like rules, and we can, like I mentioned earlier, we want to really define. We want to remove as many false positives as possible. We want to give good coding practices and standards. And this tool allows you to not only pick from a massive catalog of different policies and rules, but you can define your own ones as well. So this is a really, really powerful tool. Again, very free to try out. Um, I think the CLI is open source. Um, not sure about the dashboard, but it's not come up with asking me to pay for anything yet. So happy days. Um, but yeah, really, really good to kind of define what kind of rules you want in your uh, thing. Now, there's also supply chain. So like I mentioned, Sonatype are in the supply chain area. Um, this has actually said that there's no vulnerabilities in our application. That's good, okay, brilliant. Um, 
it's not so brilliant that I designed the application to be vulnerable. So um, I'll come back to this later. Um, but yes, just showing you that this is a really, really great tool. But again, you've got to be careful with the data that backs up all these tools. Okay. So if you really want to know how to get this started very, very quickly, um, I'll just delete the project I've got. Do, do, do. Okay, so all you have to pretty much do, you can do it locally. Uh, if you've got the CLI downloaded, I'm just using GitHub. Click GitHub Actions, um, Sync Projects. Now I've got it set so it'll only pick up this specific repository, but you can have it scan all your repositories. Um, I've got quite a lot, so I'm not going to do that. But all you have to do is essentially add the CLI jobs. It commits a basically config file. You can have a look at that here if you really want. Um, standard config file for um, SEMgrep. And then you just commit the file. It'll essentially commit that file and then kick off essentially a scan. Um, that takes for this project probably about three or four minutes. But again, I'm not going to have you sit there watching a little circle going round and round. So um, hopefully that demonstrates like how easy it is to get started with these tools. Again, do check out SEMgrep. It is really, really powerful. Um, and yeah, it can hopefully help enforce better coding practices and standards in your, um, in your uh, organizations. So um, now I'm going to move on to another component that we should all be doing as well as source code analysis, which is software composition analysis, so SCA for short. So SCA is essentially a way of having a look what's inside your applications. I like to use the cake analogy. Um, it's a very colorful cake, but probably a lot of E numbers in there, but we won't go into that. Um, so <laughs> as... Uh, Software composition analysis, um, yeah, basically looking at what's inside your application. Um, why do we need that? Well, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we all wrote our own code, right? Now we have the world of open source. We can share code really, really easily, okay? Um, we should all know the benefits of open source code, you know, having to be able to study, modify, redistribute it, copy it. Um, you have a massive community of people looking at it from all different angles, all different places, different mentalities around the world, so it can help there um, fix bugs quickly. Um, usually, it's um, free, right? That's generally what open source code is. Um, and again, having lots of people collaborate all over the world is uh, generally a really good thing. Now, the thing is, things have changed. Like I said, why do we have to care about SCA? Well, if we go back, say, um, 25 years, 30 years, we weren't sharing that much open source code, right? Now, every application, we did some studies, and every application that is shipped is generally about 90% open source. That means, nowadays, 90% of your applications, you didn't write, okay? I mean, we know why we do that. Imagine if we had to spend 90% of our time rewriting writing all that stuff we get through open source. It would stifle our innovation. So we're not going to stop doing that, but the time saving we're getting by not having to write 90% of the code we ship, we should be paying attention to other things, right? Um, and that introduces me to some of the problems with the software supply chain. Um, you may have seen some of these slides before. I like using them because they like to scare fear into people, right? Like to make you think about these things more. Um, but if we take an average Java project, for example, um, you've got 150 dependencies. Um, those dependencies, say, have an average 10 releases per year. All of a sudden, 25 years ago, we didn't have to worry about this. Now, we have to worry about 1,500 dependency updates every year, right? And those dependencies are coming from, we've all probably seen this before, that poor person in Nebraska maintaining, you know, the 90% of the logic that's in our applications, okay? And this gets even harder because we think, okay, we look at our POM file, we're only downloading, you know, Spring, Spring Web, but then that's pulling in all of this and then all of that and all of that and so on and so forth. So it's not a case of us just having to worry about what's in our POM file. We have to worry about what all of them are bringing in, okay? And that's where software composition analysis tools come in. So I would say a basic software composition analysis tool will basically look at what declared dependencies you've got, give you some basic information, such as the latest version available, a bit like what Dependabot does, right? So um, imagine some of you have used Dependabot before. That's basically what it does, okay? 
Um, and it can obviously create pull requests to update those. But more advanced tools will look at a lot of other things like transistive dependencies, um, vulnerability and license data, project scoring is a new thing that's becoming quite common. Um, I think OpenSSF and lots of other foundations are coming together to try and create a kind of framework for scoring open source projects to make them better and make the people that work on them um, adhere to better programming practices. So that's something these tools can look at. Um, visualizations, like I showed you before, having to be able to visualize what's going on in each dependency you bring down. Um, and produce SBOM, software bill of materials. And I'll talk a little bit about those later and why they're important. So this is the scary part and the slides I like to use. Um, why software composition analysis matters. Well, so this was 2016. I actually have information from 2024 as well. Um, but in 2016, cybercrime overtook the drug trade, right? 450 billion US dollars um, a year. That's a lot of money. Um, 14,000 US dollars a second, equivalent to 50 of the world's largest nuclear aircraft carriers. Bear in mind, I think in total, the United States has about 10 or 11 aircraft carriers. Um, and in 2016, they could build 50 of them with the money they make. Do you think that got worse in 2022? Of course it did. What is it now? Uh, well, in 2022, we're at 6 trillion US dollars a year. 200,000 US dollars a second, that's equivalent to 620 of these nuclear aircraft carriers. Like that's a crazy, crazy amount of money, right? I, I mean, I'm glad they're not all coming together to like, put this money in one pot because that would be scary if they could spend this, right? And if that was, um, if that was the GDP of a country, and again, this is 2022, it would be the third largest country in the world in terms of GDP. So, again, cybercrime probably wasn't a thing 30, 40 years ago. The introduction of the internet helps the cybercriminals a lot. Um, and now they're getting to the point where they can't break through our firewalls. So now they're getting very clever. They're trying to get into our open source projects. There's been lots of cases, even recently, where they have been pretending to be committers on these open source projects, been convincing other members of these projects to hand over the projects to them, so they can put malware and vulnerabilities into these projects, right? So I read the other day, we're now at 9 trillion in 2024. Um, I saw this on a news article and then verified it on the internet. There was a lot of different sources for this, so go Google it. Um, but yeah, 9 trillion US dollars. Let's put, let's put that into perspective, shall we? Um, that's a year's salary for 162 million teachers. That's 36,000 celebrity divorces. Not actually that much, right? <laughs> um, we're also talking, that's a lot of Toyota Priuses. I don't see as many Priuses around here as I do in the UK, but that's a lot of Toyota Priuses, right? And you know, what makes the most impacts? That's 11.97 trillion chocolate bars, guys. That's a lot of chocolate, right? God, if they were only eating that, they'd probably all die of obesity, but unfortunately, they're not. They're spending it on other things. And if this person, this guy was around today, we all know who he is, Mr. Pablo Escobar. I don't think he would be in the drug trade. Why would he? We know what happens to drug dealers. They end up getting shot, right? They end up getting killed, put in prison. He would probably be sitting in that basement and instead of all this money, he'd have hackers all around. That's what I believe he'd be doing today. So times are changing, right? This is some data that came from IBM. And we saw this with Log4J. Um, it was one of the last years I was working at IBM, actually. Um, luckily, the product I worked on, WebSphere, didn't actually have Log4J embedded into it, but it was in our tests and it was in lots of other places. So we still had a bit of a scramble. And of course, all our customers call, calling, up, uh, calling us up to make sure Log4J wasn't in their um, runtimes. But what we've noticed, if we go back to 2006, we had an average of 45 days before a vulnerability, from when a vulnerability was announced until hackers and bad people started to take advantage of it. Whereas what we saw with Log4J, we were down to about a day, right? That's scary, especially when you consider what open source powers these days, okay? Open source, po oh, open source powers medical devices. I have seen code in insulin pumps, which has open source dependencies in it. Aircraft uses open source code. Cars, especially electric cars, use open source code. Trains use open source code, right? 
I mean, everyone complains about the trains being late in Germany as it is. You don't want to give them more excuse to be late by them getting hacked, right? So I don't actually think your trains are that late, but I'm coming from Britain where our trains are always late, so we're just used to it, really, I guess. Um, yeah, so we, again, we've got to be very, very careful, right? And governments around the world are waking up to this. Um, I like to use a story. I had a German car. I won't name the manufacturer, just in case any employees are here from there. Um, and it had a defect, right? And the defect was, it was a brand new car, that if you went round a roundabout too quickly, um, the airbag could go off. Like, what? So I spent like six months going round roundabouts really slowly. It's like the worst time for an airbag to go off when you're going round a corner. Like, what? And of course, um, being manufacturing, they had to recall the vehicle because that's dangerous, right? But we don't have that same legislation in software, in software development. Um, not to the same strict lengths that go, they go to in manufacturing, right? But now we're responsible for people's lives with the applications we're building, okay? Um, I mean, I honestly think we'll be the last people on earth still working. I mean, we'll all be dead before then, that's fine. But essentially, our job as software engineers is to automate the world, right? Um, finally, we'll eventually, in say 500 years, we'll get to a utopia, we've automated everything, and we'll still be working, and everyone else will be having a nice time at the beach. But um, legislation is coming, whether we like it or not, um, and we should be proactive rather than reactive, okay? Um, let's see how much time I've got. Okay, I'm all good. But yeah, we need to be proactive rather than reactive, because humans are very, very reactive race, okay? We like to fix things when they break. We don't main try we not very good at maintaining stuff or fixing the problem before it's actually really impactful. I mean, I honestly believe we will fix global warming. We have the technology now to fix it. We have the money and the technology to fix it now. Do you know why we won't? Because it's not affecting us enough yet. And I still hope we can reverse it and have the money and technology to do when it comes. But it just goes to show that humans are very, very reactive rather than proactive, okay? So the United States government, for example, um, launched a national cyber security strategy. Um, this is basically making companies more responsible for the code they ship. If they ship code that endangers someone's life or purposely has vulnerabilities in, etc., and they get hacked, um, those companies will be held liable. Someone in those companies will go to prison. Okay. Um, one of the other things, I haven't got to S-bombs yet, but one of the other things they um, are demanding essentially that any company that sells software to the US government has to provide an SBOM, right? Software Bill of Materials. Um, who's heard of Cyber Resiliency Act in the EU? Hands up, anyone? A few of you. Well, you all should know about this, okay? Because this is a very more, bit more restrictive than the US one. Um, I'm pretty sure it's passed and it's come into force. I don't know how it works. But essentially what they're trying to do is they're requiring SBOMs, same as the US. Um, they're also... Um, holding companies liable for anything that goes wrong. But if you ship, you're not allowed to ship applications to a government entity in the EU if it has vulnerabilities. And if it does, you have to have a bloody good reason why. And you also have to have a path to fix that vulnerability at a later date, okay? So that's the one thing. The other thing is they're essentially holding uh, companies that work on open source projects responsible for those projects, okay? So say I work for Sonatype, I'm working on an open source project that Sonatype might be using or other companies might be using. If there's a vulnerability in there that I know about and I haven't reported or something like that, um, I can then be held responsible. So we've got to be very, very careful and you should all know about this law because you all live in the EU and you have to deal with it, okay? So please do read up on this law because it may impact you all in the next few years. Um, UK is the UK. We're a bit behind. Um, we don't require S-bombs or anything like that at the moment. It's a bit of the Wild West in terms of open source. But again, just another government entity. And it's not just those three countries, um, Australia, India, um, Singapore, and lots of other countries around the world are trying to implement these kind of um, legislation. And I know why they're doing it. It makes sense because it's hard to hold engineers and software companies accountable for some of these things. And they're getting very scared with all the hackers and all the cyber crime that's going on in the world. So they're trying to prevent it and make us all, as engineers, pay more attention to these things. So software bill of materials, SBOMs, are they going to help us? Um, yes and no. I mean, me and my colleagues spent the whole of last year preaching to everyone why they should be making SBOMs. But if you're not doing anything with them, then they're a bit useless. 
Um, there's really no excuse to not generate them. Um, for example, Cyclone DX has a Maven plugin, Kubernetes has a plugin, Microsoft has one. Um, Docker Scouts, if you're using containers, there's a plugin there. So there is lots of different ways to generate SBOMs. But we've also got to be careful that people are now trying to hack our SBOMs, right? So an SBOM is essentially a document which records everything that's in your application at the time you produce that SBOM. It's a document that you can hand to anyone that's buying your software. They can throw that into analysis tool and they can then essentially have a look to see if there's any vulnerabilities or anything they should worry about in your applications. And then they can come back to you and ask, like what the governments are planning to do, is why do you have vulnerabilities here? Do you not know about these vulnerabilities? And what is your plan to fix these vulnerabilities further down the line? But then, of course, every attack vector, there's a new attack vector, and people are trying to hack into our S-bombs to trick our S-bombs, uh, to change our S-bombs, sorry. So the people we give them to um, are li essentially lied to and they are confused about what's in our applications. So there's lots of efforts going on to essentially sign our S-bombs and things like that to make sure they don't get hacked. So I'm going to show you, um, it's not Sonatype Developer, but it's, it's something called Lifecycle, and I'm just going to scan the same application um, we used earlier, okay? So rather than connect, uh, you can connect this to um, GitHub, but I'm just going to scan an S-bomb I generated. So I've already got an organization, I don't need that. I'm going to create a new application. Do, do, do. We're going to call it uh, JCon. JCon. I'll give it a little robot. Why not? There we go. All right. So I've created my application. Um, I'm just going to upload. I downloaded the same um, repository that I used in the um, static analysis tool. And I'm going to upload the SBOM I generated with um, Docker Scout. OK, so uh, that's the one. OK. Uh, don't worry about that. I'll just say build. Okay, upload. It won't take long. Um, so again, I've generated an SBOM. Um, it has the contents of what's in my application. Um, the application is identical. It's the same repository that I scanned with the static analysis tool. Um, but this lifecycle is built not for code analysis. Um, this is built to look at your open source dependencies and have a look at those. Okay. Now, if you remember, if we go back here, um, the supply chain, this part, which is supposed to report vulnerabilities, reported there was no vulnerabilities, okay? If I go to Lifecycle, for example, I can already see there is vulnerabilities there, and that's a severity 9 vulnerability, okay? So, the re and what this can do, it can tell you what versions to move to that doesn't have vulnerabilities, um, things like that, which ones have breaking changes, blah, 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 and you can compare them. But the point here is, what I'm trying to demonstrate is, a tool is only as good as the data that backs it up, okay? It may have all the functionality in the world, but if it doesn't have the right data, like the vulnerability data we're using in Lifecycle, for example, um, it's no good because I, it has just missed two massive vulnerabilities in the code I've created, right? So that's very, very important, okay? Um, it's all about the data that backs up these tools. Um, if you want to try this out, for example, you're welcome. Um, I've essentially got the team at Sonotype to stand up an instance of this just for JCon. Um, don't all sign up at once because it is literally people provisioning this in the background. But it's the same tool, essentially. Um, it's free for like 30 days, so play around with it. And scan your applications. Have a look to see if they're vulnerable, if they're not vulnerable, because this might give you a good idea, essentially, um, of if you need to change some of the practices you're doing in terms of the open source dependencies you're picking. Because we want to pick good open source dependencies as early on as possible, right? Um, so do try it out if you get a chance to. Um, but yeah, going back to the point where I was earlier is, so while SEMgrep is really, really good for code analysis, that tool might not be so good for the uh, for static analysis and code analysis. It might not be so good for vulnerability analysis and things like those, okay? Um, the reason Sonotype is quite good, we've been doing this from uh, the beginning. Um, we have our own database and our own data for a lot of this stuff. A lot of people use a national vulnerability database to get their vulnerability data. I think there's like a two-month backlog or a month backlog to get new vulnerabilities in there, right? That's a, that's a long time for vulnerabilities that tools are using to not be actually surfacing to the top, right? Um, and the National Vulnerability Database is not generally the most accurate database in the world. We at Sonotype have corrected 33% of that database, right? This is what most people use for their vulnerability data, and we've had to go in and correct 33% of it. So um, there are other great tools out there that have good data as well, but just saying, tools are only as good as the data that backs them up. 
Now, we fast forward to nowadays where um, there is lots of foundations and organizations that are popping up to essentially try and fix this issue, okay? Um, and it's not that hard. There is some real, I mean, automation is our friend here. We want to automate as much of this as possible, um, but it really is not that hard to fix some of these things. So we did a study at Sonatype at, to look at open source projects to see which open source projects, um, what, what are the differences that can be made to those projects to make them more secure? Um, and it was very, very simple. The biggest things, for example, branch protection. Who's not using branch protection on GitHub? Um, code reviews, things like that. These are really, really simple, simple things we can do in our open source projects to make them much more secure. And this is even more important now because when we're trying to create project scorecards and scoring and things like that, this is the kind of stuff they're going to look at, right? So if anyone's involved in open source projects, make sure you're using branch protection. Try and do code reviews because having a second set of eyes can tr avoid things like, you know, that vulnerability I showed you at the beginning where it's an equals rather than a uh, larger than equals and things like that. Uh, yeah, so we've done that one. So to summarize, Avoid things like this. This is what static analysis tools can do. They can avoid silly mistakes like this that can introduce vulnerabilities in your code, okay? Um, they can help us in lots of different ways. Um, they can help with programming errors. They can help with enforcing coding standards and best practices, syntax violations, um, security vulnerabilities, okay? And as a consequence, like I mentioned before, they can help create more efficient applications. We all need to save a bit of electricity, right? Um, they can improve developers' coding skills. And I mean, I talk about efficiency. Imagine if we could improve our application's efficiency by 5%. Imagine if we did that for every application in the world, how much energy we save. A huge amount, right? Um, we can make our code easier to read, so the generation after us that looks after the code base is not ripping their hair out, right? We can shorten time for development, and we can make ourselves all heroes, right? We can improve how good we are at, as engineers and developers and make life better for everybody, okay? Um, so, and also, the, my point is, all types of analysis when you're looking at your software is important, okay? Not just static analysis, not just source code, but every type of analysis. The more things you can get to look at your application, your code, providing it's not consuming loads of resources, is good. Because, like I mentioned, Sonatype runs Maven Central. This was, what was it, 2022? Worst vulnerability in Java's history. Um, we had 51 million downloads, right? I took a screenshot. Um, a few days ago. We've got a dashboard, you can access it, it's updated weekly. What do you think it is nowadays? Do you think people have stopped downloading Log4j? I don't think they have, because we're now at 354 million <laughs> downloads, guys. Stop downloading the vulnerable versions of Log4j, please. Oh, yeah. But yeah, it's high, right? And that's 33% in the history of Log4j, I think, that um, have downloaded vulnerable versions. People ask, why don't we take it down from Maven Central? Um, we don't do that because it's a vulnerability. It's not malware. So if you don't know, the difference between a vulnerability and malware is malware is malicious. Malware is put there on purpose to do something bad, okay? A vulnerability is generally a coding mistake or some kind of mistake which has opened up a security issue, okay? Um, Maven Central, because we have domain protection and things like that, I did a talk, I think, here, I think it was last year, um, about Maven Central. You can find it online. But Maven Central has domain protection, right? And why that might be annoying for us who have to manage all those domains, and it might be for anyone here that uploads stuff to Maven Central, it means we have no malware in Maven Central. I think in history we had one piece of malware there, which someone told me my company was put there on purpose to see if our scanners could pick it up, etc. So. Yes, why we're quite secure in Java in terms of not downloading malware from places like Maven Central, um, a lot of the other ecosystems aren't, okay? Um, Python and Node, their repositories are just absolutely full of malware. We have to do takedown notices on a daily basis from those repositories, um, and they don't do it instantly, okay? So that malware is sitting there for a, a small amount of time, which people are downloading and putting into their applications. So I've got four minutes left, okay. So there's some useful links here. Um, if you want to know but more about source code versus bytecode analysis, check that out there. Second link is a history of software supply chain attacks. Um, the state of the software supply chain report is where I got a lot of my data from, where we do a lot of research for this stuff. If you want the log4j data, that's all there. If you want to know more about um, what they're doing in the US with their legislation, you can check that out there. Um, do get in touch. Um, we're on social media, as most companies are. Um, 
Me and my colleague wrote a series about software composition analysis on Fuji. So go check that out if you get a chance. Um, and you've all probably noticed Maven Central has changed. Yes, it had to change at some point because it looked like it was built in the 90s. Um, but yes, um, Maven Central, we're trying to build some certain things into Maven Central, like project scoring and things like that. So you can make better choices before you actually download these dependencies, okay? Um, if you want any of my information, um, uh, or any of my slides, just go there. I know I work for a company that's in security and I know QR codes are not the most secure thing in the world, but JCon asked me to put a QR code up there, so, you know, um, no difference, right? Um, and without further ado, that is me done with three minutes left. So thank you all for having me and listening to my talk today. Okay, I need your phone. Like, questions. So we're supposed to be using... Let me go back to the slide. Uh, yeah, I, I, I use your thing because otherwise I have to show everyone my emails. And you don't want to read my emails, do you? <laughs> I can indeed. Thank you. So question number one. Is it safe to use SEMgrep for closed source projects? In other words, what are the security risks concerning the source code? Um, I think it is safe. I would look at SEMgrep's terms and conditions. Um, I have used it for closed source stuff before. Um, probably should have read their terms and conditions, but generally I think it is safe. I think it's okay, but again, do your own research because that can depend very much on your restrictions, what you want them as a company to get have a look at, but they might have specific um, solutions for those scenarios, right? So I didn't really answer your question there, but hopefully that will allow you to go and um, have a look and try and find the information. So second question is, why is Sonotype so bloody expensive? <laughs> Especially when language, large language model capabilities are rising quickly and might become a very good and more affordable option. Why is Sonotype so expensive? Well, because we have to run Maven Central for you all, obviously. <laughs> um, so Maven, Sonotype, I mean, you say it's expensive, but we do have teams that compare um, between us and competitors, and I'm pretty sure we're about the same. I don't know the pricing of Sonotype stuff generally. I I am not in sales. Um, I'm not here to sell you Sonotype stuff. I'm just here to talk about why this stuff is important. If you choose us, then great. But one of the key differentiators, and I kind of mentioned this, is the data we have, right? We have our own database, um, which is a collection of all the external free databases and our own data. So we can pick up stuff very, very quickly. So for example, when Log4J happened, we notified our customers within minutes, okay? We notified them, told them where it is. So they didn't have to panic as much as they did. Um, whereas when I was at IBM, we didn't have that stuff. Do you know how many bloody repositories I had to go through to figure out where that dependency was? It's ridiculous, right? So that's one of the reasons, essentially, um, Sonatype prides itself on its tools. Yes, some of the GUIs might not be the best, but we try and provide the best data we can. And that's because we've been in this game for, I don't know, 15 years now, 12 years. We've been gathering all this data, trying to find out the, what's... And we have a massive security research team, okay? It's like 10 or 20 people that all they do all day is go through um, open source dependencies and they know exactly what to look for. It's quite scary. Like, you'll have a dependency that goes off to this LDAP server, pulls down this script, that script will run, it'll go off to this uh, server, it'll pull down something there. Um, so this stuff, as, as good as AI is, AI has to be trained. Um, we actually do have AI on our firewall product, which our security engineers do train. But um, at the end of the day, uh, it's quite easy to trick AI. Um, it's actually very easy to trick AI. Um, it's a lot harder to trick um, good, clever humans most of the time. Um, so that's the thing. A lot of the software we produce and what we have is underpinned by a lot of humans in the background. And developers are expensive, right? When we don't come free. So um, that's probably the reason, yeah. But again, I don't actually know the pricing of stuff. So any more questions? And with that, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.